Okay, good. Okay. Well. Okay, that's okay. It's transcriptions on. Um, I don't know how good it's going to be. So how when till I start? Shall I wait until there are about 25? Okay, we can start, I think. We'll start now? Okay. Let me share my screen. But. So, um, I'm Peter Latham. I, you probably know that. Oops. Um, do you, does everybody know um, where the website is? For the, just in case, I'll write it down. So, I put all sorts of notes on. Um, our website, my website, ht. I think this is my website. Oh, no, that's not my website. No HTTP. It's just www. So you can get the web, the first part of the website just by Googling my name and the rest is And I put um so last year's course is on there. I'm teaching a little bit different. I'm not teaching biophysics anymore, so not all of it's relevant. Plus, I will have modified my lectures, but there's tons of stuff on that web page now. So, what we're going to talk about today is, or today, next, I don't know, 12 or so lectures, is how networks of neurons operate. And I'm going to start with a little bit of background, just to, just to put things in context. So, What's the goal of neuroscience? Okay. What's the goal of neuroscience? So you guys have been taking this course for a couple of weeks, uh, weeks now. Oh, so by the way, you should feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, I'm guessing I go, I may go a little bit too fast. There are times I may not be clear. I'm kind of guessing what you guys know. Um, and so definitely stop me at any time, raise your hand or just interrupt. That's I'm, I'm okay with that. And actually there was one thing I wanna, uh, before we get to this, okay. Sorry, there's something I wanted to tell you. Okay, Matthew needs to know. So Matthew need. So no, 
This means be reasonably familiar with. So this is stuff I'm gonna be using all the time. So one is ordinary differential equations. Um, and mainly if you've, if you've taken, I don't know what quite what your background is. If you're taking physics, you'll definitely have seen those. Um, the other one is incredibly important is Taylor expansions. But relatively straightforward. Three is linear algebra. Again, you don't have to need an expert, but you need to know about matrices. So matrices and vectors. Four is a central limit theorem. And five is um, linear regression. So the first, the first four of these are going to be used for the for this course. I mean, for the next couple of weeks, the next few weeks. And believe it or not. When we get to um, deep networks, we're going to be using linear regression a lot. So again, you don't have to know all these super deep, deeply, but you might want to brush up on them if you're not if you're not kind of experts. Okay, so let's as way of introduction, goal of neuroscience. So people are sometimes clear about what this means, sometimes not. Um, and it's kind of to understand how the brain works, but that has a sort of specific meaning. And that is explain behavior Explain behavior in terms of neural circuits. And if you look about half, at about half the web pages, any neuroscience institutes, that's what they say. Um, I swear half the papers in systems neuroscience start off like that and probably 90% of the grants. Um, but what does that mean? And what it really means, I think what it really means, what it really means to me is to, it's sort of a two-step process. Step one, what happened here? So what does this mean? So step one is, there are two parts to this program explaining behavior in terms of neural circuits. One is write down a bunch of equations. Sorry, what's going on here? Write down equations describing uh, 
neural circuits. And two, link those equations to behavior. Okay. Now, we don't actually know exactly what it means to link equations to behavior. It's some, we want some kind of analytical link um, without doing massive simulations, but that doesn't matter too much because we're sort of stuck here. So you've been learning a little about, about biophysics and you know that neurons are connected to each other with synaptic strengths. Um, so neurons are connected to each other with synaptic strength. I'm gonna call them the uh, weights. So WIJ. So WIJ equals connection strength. From neuron, from neuron J to neuron I. So remember, when neuron J fires, you get uh, some something happens in neuron I. You get a, a EPSP excitatory inhibitory plus synaptic potential, um, and there are a lot of weights in the brain. So the human. So human, they're 10 to the 14th weights. Even the fly, they're 10 to the ninth billion weights. And we don't know what they are. Okay. We have no idea how what all these synaptic strengths are. And what that means is, um, write down the equations. We can't write down the equations because we don't know what the equations are, because we don't know what the weights are. Okay. So it's kind of a bit of a setback if you think about it. We can't really do neuroscience because we don't know what's going on. Um, now that doesn't mean we can do nothing. There are a couple options we can do. We can make, we can try to measure the weights, but that's not going to happen. There are too many of them. Um, so ultimately we have to think about learning and I'm going to talk about learning a little later, but learning, remember, if you think about learning, um, sorry, I have to wait for this to go. There we go. So learning. What that does is, is basically that's how it tells you how synaptic strengths change with, with some kind of activity, some kind of teaching signal maybe. And I'm gonna talk about that a fair amount, but learning remember starts off with weights. Think of the weights, it's a vector at zero, t equals zero. And then as time evolves, So the weights W at T goes to W at zero plus delta W. Okay. And it's really just delta W that's the interesting part, right? That's, that's what allows the brain to do super amazing stuff. But what I'm gonna do today is talk about the weights before learning. Okay, that's what I'm going to talk about in this lecture. Next, this lecture, next, 
next lecture, what I'm going to do is before learning, before learning, um, the weights are random. Okay, so this may seem like a really dumb thing to do, but it turns out there are a couple of reasons we want to do it. One is, one is actually going to be a little more clear later. Um, but the idea is that the initial, so as time goes on, it's becoming increasingly clear um, that initial connectivity matters. Um, and so if, when you, if you try, try to train a deep network, um, the initial weights make a, which is really the initial architecture, make a big, big difference in how well it does. Um, and those are for feed forward networks. In the brain, their recurrent connectivity um, and understanding recurrent connectivity just with random connecting weights appears to be a good idea. To tell you the truth, nobody knows for sure, but um, at least it's a problem we can solve. So what we're gonna do is, is basically try to understand how networks of neurons with randomly connected networks, um, randomly connected weights, understand their dynamics. Um, and that dynamics turns out to be surprisingly rich. Um, so for instance, so here are some observations we're gonna to try to explain. So first of all, fine weights in the brain are low. So nobody knows exactly how low, but probably a few Hertz. So each neuron is firing a few spikes per second. Um, so you also tend to see oscillatory behavior is very common. So why is a few Hertz strange? The maximum firing rate of a neuron is, is about hundred Hertz. Okay. And if we were, I was designed the brain, I would have it either fire sort of a zero or hundred, like a flip-flop, um, like a logic gate. Um, but it doesn't, it chooses to fire at a few Hertz and that's actually kind of hard to explain. So oscillations are also common. So if you stuck an electrode in the brain, you'd see, actually I could do this. So here, what happens when you stick an electrode in the brain, even if some animals, it's not doing anything. Um, you'll see this is vol voltage and this is time. So what you'll see is, you know, pretty random looking firing. Sometimes it fires. So it's, it's random, random looking. The firing rates are low, and if you plot an average firing rate versus time, so this is uh, this is V for voltage. So you instead plot an average firing rate of lots of neurons. Um, you actually see these sort of oscillations at various firing rate frequencies, typically. So the oscillation frequency is anywhere from uh, typically five to maybe 40 Hertz. And it can be higher, a little bit lower, okay? And so, and the question is, can we get these out of, so are these features of learned networks or can we get them out of randomly connected networks? And it turns out you can get them out of randomly connected networks and the behavior actually is even richer than this. Um, so I'm going to describe a little bit, a little bit of behavior. So today, we're going to focus only on, on this thing. How do you get low firing rates? Which turns out to be a problem that was solved only relatively recently. Okay. So really, the background is, you know, what we want to know is, is a bunch of equations. For the equations, we need the weights. We have no idea what the weights are, so we're going to do what what scientists often do, look where the light is and assume the weights are just random and see what, okay? 
So let's start with what I think is going to be some little bit of review. So, sorry, go ahead. Is there a question? Okay. A little bit of review. So remember, um, so you saw linear integrate and in fire neuron tau dvi. equals minus vi minus e leak um, plus external input. <clears throat> um, this is linear um, plus i external. And it's gotta be multiplied by resistance to get the right units. <clears throat> um, so this is an LIF limit neuron. LIF, linear integrated and fire, simplest neuron in the world. Um, and external, and so remember if this neuron exceeds threshold, it emits a spike and, and goes back to threshold. And you get it, uh, the augment this week, this could be Huxley neuron, you can make them, really complicated, but what I want to focus on now is not the, the sort of, sorry, this is for neuron I. Sorry, oops. So this is neuron I. So what I want to focus on is actually this term. And for neuron in the brain, it, this term is basically, this is neuron I. There are lots of other neurons connected to it, okay? So all this external drive is coming from another neuron. And we model these with, um, we model this term. Oops, what happened? We model this term with sum over x sum on j of w i j. I'm gonna write g j of t. Okay. So w i j does this is a, the connection strength. Remember w i j connection strength from neuron j from one of these neurons to neuron i, and g j of t is base is. So gj of t is just a little bull, a blip in time. So basically, whenever neuron j spikes, gj jumps up. If it spikes twice in a row, it looks like this. So this is, these are spike times of spikes on neuron J, okay? Whenever neuron J spikes, you get a little blip. If W is positive, you get excitatory, an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. When W is negative, you get an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And of course, the, um, the higher the firing rates and the, the, the more often G, GJ is non-zero, the bigger the influence this neuron has on the postsynaptic neuron. Um, and of course, the weight is different for every neuron, but this WIJ is about, so this term is about half a millivolt, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, we could make this more realistic. So this is called a current base model. So if you want to be more realistic, We can make it a conducted makes base model by um, putting in. So this is a little bit of an aside. This would make it conducted spaced. But we're not going to do that. So I'm going to take this out and ignore. It's more realistic, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. 
In fact, we're not really going to use that that much any, anyway. Um, actually, you need a you need a minus sign here to make things rigorous. Okay. Um, so so what's the point of all this? So when the weights are structured, all sorts of interesting things are going to can happen. But if the weights are unstructured, presumably the fine rate of the fine rate of this neuron <clears throat> depends mainly on sort of the average fine rate of the neurons over here. Okay. And maybe some I dependence, these, depending on these WIJs. So WIJ, remember, it's, we assume it's completely random, there's no structure. So if I tell you the fine rate of all these neurons, um, fine rate, that's the fine rate of all the neurons going into here, you should know more or less the fine rate of that neuron. So that's the assumption we're going to make. And, except we're going to actually not quite do that. Um, what we're going to do is divide neurons up into excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And we're going to assume this is the big assumption. It's not exactly um, satisfied, but it's not so far off. So new I is a fine rate of neuron I is some function of it may depend on I of the ex average ex ex excitatory firing rate and average inhibitory firing rate. Okay, huge assumption. So let's be clear about what these terms are. This is firing rate of neuron I. Okay, average excitatory firing rate. This average firing rate of the excitatory neurons. Call it E neurons. I don't call I'll spell it out. Running out of room. Excitatory neurons. And new I is average firing rate of Inhibitory neurons. Okay. So this is this is a pretty big assumption. Um, okay. Um, and it's our main assumption that we're going to sort of everything is going to rest on, uh, except we're going to augment it in two ways. So first of all, um, I'm going to let new be excitatory inhibitory. So we want to basically, we want to keep, um, okay. So excitatory inhibitory neurons are different. They can have different firing rates. So, so this is, so remember what this is. This is the average firing, if, if you specify the firing rate of excitatory neurons, the excited firing rate of inhibitory neurons, that gives you some equilibrium firing rate of excitatory neuron I, okay? But what happens if the excitatory neurons were firing at too high a rate um, relative to this equilibrium? Then what you expect is for is for tau 
So tau e. So this is another major, majorly large assumption. Okay. So we're giving this dynamics. This is really, really important. Okay. If the actual fine with this neuron is, is much lower than its equilibrium value, it's going to go up. So this is what DDT is. DDT is positive, nu e is increasing. If this is much higher than its equilibrium value, this is going to go down. So some time constant tau e. So these are massively made up equations, um, but they surprise. They work surprisingly well. Okay, so these are the Wilson account Wilson Cowan equations. I'll put the reference on the web page. So paper on the web page. And basically I'm going to be focusing on the, well, they're not the Wilson and Cowan equations yet. Uh, sorry, they're going to actually make them Wilson and Cowan equations in just a second. And to do that, I'm going to average over index I on the right-hand side, on both sides. So I'm going to write, if this is true, we can write tau E DDT of one over N E the sum on i of new ei equals, so we're basically averaging, um, just basically averaging this over index. We're averaging over all excitatory neurons minus one over ne, the sum on i of new ei. And remember, by definition, this is just new E, the average excitatory fine rate. This is new E as well. And this, we're going to give a name. We're going to call this psi E without the index I. Okay? So the equations become tau E, the new E, dt equals psi E new e and new i minus new e and tau i d new i dt equals psi i of new e new i minus new i. So these are the equations we're going to deal with the rest of the lecture and they're the Wilson account equations. Okay. Okay. So far, so good. Um, and what we're going to do is say, is given these equations, what's the behavior of the excitatory inhibitory firing rates? And that's going to tell us what's going, to, going on in a network before learning is going on. And I need to do one more thing, which is tell you what psi E and psi look, I look like. And they look about the same. Sorry, I have to wait for, there we go. And they look about the same. So if you plot it on this axis, new E, psi E, you can put either psi E or so I, they look about the same. Basically, if this is zero, at some point, they go up rather steeply. So they max out at about 100 hertz. Um, and they're kind of steep. I'm going to get to this quantitatively at the end of, uh, at, at the end of this. But this is, this is within 5 to 10 hertz. When the average excitatory, um, excitatory firing rate increases by, by, by between 5 and 10 hertz, this thing jumps up to almost 100 hertz. Okay. And we'll see that especially later on. Um, if that's when you plot, that's if you plot versus new E, if you plot versus new I, it's kind of the opposite. Um, 
actually let's it's plot versus new i so of course um this plot here depends on the value of new i right if new i is really large um so this is So for instance, so if new i, this is new i larger. And let's say this is new i small, right? As excited as, so as the more, remember, so let's go back to our equations. Um, Psi E and Psi I depend on both new E and new I, okay? And new E tends to make this function bigger. The more the excited turn neurons are firing rate, the more our post, our, the side turn, easy to see up here. The higher the average firing rate, the higher the firing rate of any particular neuron. And the higher the inhibitory firing rate, the lower the firing rate of any particular neuron. And so we can also plot, um, Sorry, I have to wait for, there we go. We can also plot psi e and psi i versus nu e, nu i. This is a little more problematic because if it starts off, for instance, at zero, it's gonna stay at zero forever. So this is where this might be nu e new e equals zero. However, if new e is higher, so this is larger new e. Okay. If new e is even larger, go to that here. Yeah. Okay. So for instance, uh, Typical example would be psi e equals, let's say, 100 times sigma of, let's say, about 10 new e minus new i, and then minus theta naught. So sigma is our sigmoid, you say a sigmoid function, sigma of x equals e to the x over one plus e to the x, okay? And if we put theta naught, so remember this thing peaks at about, um, when x equals zero, this is a half, when x equals one, it's, um, well, when x is, let's say, let's say this is minus, minus three or so, So now when new e equals new i, um, this is about zero. So if you plotted psi e versus new e minus new i, um, not very high. So when new e equals new i, this is sigmoid of, of, actually this is plus three. Oops. So when new e equals new i, this is zero. Um, sigmoid of uh, sigmoid of minus three is pretty small, but as soon as new e equals new i is about three hertz, this goes up very rapidly. This is 100. So that's sort of, this is around three hertz. Actually, this is around 0 0.3 hertz. Um, doesn't matter. Point that's not, it's kind of thing, kind of thing, uh, Kind of function these sigmoids look like. Okay, so given, so we have two things right now. We have um, some equations, Wilson Cowan equations. We have the shapes of these sigmoids. And we want to understand the behavior of these ordinary differential equations. 
okay? Um, and for that, we're going to ultimately use no clients and, and linear analysis. Um, but before we do that, let's consider an easier problem that's going to illustrate all the ideas. An all excitatory network. This is a network with only excitatory neurons, okay? And um, we're gonna ask, can we, so the equation is now very, very simple. Tau E, D psi E, sorry. D nu E, DT equals psi E of new E, okay? So how are we gonna find the, and we went in, oops, minus new E. So when analyzing an ODE, the first thing you always do is find the fixed points, okay? And for that, it's pretty easy. We just plot psi E versus new E, okay? Now we're gonna start off with the standard view which I assume you have seen already. Okay. Without input, they don't fire. They don't fire. Okay. So really another, another um, way of saying that is, so they, they sit at minus, they sit at, um, oops. So they sit at minus 65 millivolts and fire at So they basically sit 15 millivolts below the threshold. They sit there very quietly. Unless they get some external input, they don't fire. So what we're going to do is plot psi e. So the new, this is new e on this axis. And new e versus new e is a 45 degree line. And then we're going to plot um, psi e. And when, where psi e intersects new e, that's an equilibrium, OK? So I'm going to plot psi e here. And remember, when nu e equals zero, psi e is zero. This is what it means. If the neuron is not getting input, it can't fire. Um, so psi e is zero. And at some point, it goes up steeply, up to 100 hertz. OK. And so this has three fixed points, OK? It has points where psi e equals nu e. When psi e equals nu e, d nu e dt equals zero, that's an equilibrium, okay? Um, so this got one, oops. So it's got one here, one here, and one here, okay? And now we wanna know if they're stable. And for that, we, do standard old Taylor expansion, perturbation theory, whatever you want to call it. And we write new E equals new E zero. So new E zero is just one of these fixed points plus delta new E. Okay, nu e zero is zero is constant. So DDT of nu e zero is zero. So this the equation then becomes tau e sorry. Tau e d delta nu e dt equals psi e 
of nu e zero plus delta nu e minus nu e zero plus delta nu e. Okay, this is exact and not very useful, but now we can Taylor expand. Psi e of nu e zero plus psi e prime of nu e zero delta nu e minus nu e zero minus delta nu e. Okay, so this quantity psi e prime, you're gonna use this a lot. This is shorthand for d psi e of nu e zero, d nu e zero. Okay, so now what do we notice? We know that psi e of nu e zero by definition is equal to nu e zero, that's a fixed point. And our equations is actually now quite simple. Um, and we go to the next page and we have tau e d delta nu e dt equals psi e prime of nu e zero minus one times delta nu e. Okay. Um, I'm just going to call this K. It's just a constant. And the solution to this equation is um, delta, nu, delta nu E of T of T equals delta nu E of zero E to the K t over tau e. Okay, I'm assuming you know that. If you don't, you should verify that's a solution. Um, and so if k is less than zero, delta nu e of t decays to zero. Zero, and we have a stable fixed point. Okay, if k is greater than zero, then delta nu e of t increases and we have an unstable fixed point. Okay, now k less than zero basically K less than zero means psi e prime nu e zero is less than one. And K greater than zero means psi e prime nu e zero is greater than one. Okay. So if the slope of psi of this gain function is less than one, we have a stable fixed point. If it's greater than one, we have an unstable fixed point. And going back to our diagram, we see right away this is unstable. This is unstable, meaning it's a possible solution to our equation, but if you move even a small distance away, we would either go up to the maximum or down to the minimum. And this is, this is stable. And this is stable. Okay. So remember, if we started, that means if we started here, we go either either up to the stable fixed point at high flying rate, or if we start a little bit low, we go down to zero. So what that tells us is, is on the standard view of neurons, that I didn't put, they don't fire, um, you can get a, a firing rate, a stable equilibrium at zero, an unstable equilibrium, you can get a stable equilibrium at 100 hertz, but, um, you could get an equilibrium at low firing rate, but it's not stable. You'll never see it, okay? Um, and that's actually true even without the standard view. And I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Um, so the point is, um, all excitatory 
all excited for networks, if you have this, this sort of steep gain function with slope bigger than one, you can't get, you can't get a low firing rate equilibrium. Okay, and it's because this is unstable. Okay, um, let's take a little break. I'm trying to break, take a break after 40, 45 minutes. Um, been a little bit longer. Uh, let's just take a five minute break. I'm gonna stay on, you guys can ask any questions you want. And then we'll come back and, and add inhibitory neurons um, and try to get a low firing rate equilibrium. Okay. So take a quick five minute break. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, I I want to know what is phi e. What is phi e or psi e? Uh, oh, psi e. Uh, did I draw phi? Yes, yeah, psi. You're talking about this this mm -hmm. quantity. So this. So okay. So we had. I should have. Sorry. So remember, we had psi e was a gain function that depended on excitatory and inhibitory firing rates. Oh. So did that one make sense? Um, a little. Mm, maybe. Actually, it's easy uh. to see. Go ahead. Yeah, it makes sense. This part makes sense. Yeah, um, so this part makes sense, hopefully. So I, I was a little bit sloppy. I just said, okay, we're going to throw away all the inhibitory neurons and we're just going to cross this term out. Oh. Sorry, I should have used a different symbol, really. Oh, so it's a function. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's still a function. And it still looks like, so remember, um, the psi e and psi i is a function of nu e. They had the sigmoidal shape. So one way to think of, uh, yeah, you're right, there's really bad notation. One way to think about this psi e is we've just fixed in, we actually had some inhibitory firing rates in there, that, but they're just fixed. So for instance, I could write, sorry. I could write, I could really write, think of this as psi e of nu e and nu i zero. We're just gonna fix the, the fixing inhibitory rate. Okay. So psi e of nu e is a psi of nu e and, and nu i zero with an inhibitory rate six. We don't allow it to change. Make sense? Or make more sense? <laughs> it became worse. It became worse. Okay. Uh oh. So let's go back. So you're happy with this page? Um. Yes. So these are the, I mean, this is sort of easy, right? This says, this is an equilibrium firing rate of neuron I, excitatory neuron I, as a function of the average excitatory and average inhibitory firing rates. So that's kind uh, of easy. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, this is about two kinds of neurons. Two kinds of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this equation it may not be true, but it's kind of reasonable, right? If excitatory, you know, if, um, it just tells you that this neuron is a function of the average excitatory firing rates of the other neurons. Average excitatory and average inhibitory firing rates of the other neurons in the network. Okay. Okay. And then we average over index 
to get a, an equation for the average firing rate of the neurons in the, in the network, average excitatory firing rates and average inhibitory firing rates. So is, oh. this, is this equation okay? Oh, it's, it's an average. Um, yeah, okay. so new E is an average over all the excitatory neurons. Uh, okay. Um, so if you understand this equation, and these averages make sense, this equation should kind of make sense. Is it okay? Yeah, it's the average equation. And yeah, it, it's you change quite, it, use another sign to describe the equation. Uh, sorry, say that again. Oh, I got it. You Just got use it. another description. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically the key thing is we average here. Mm. And what I'm going to do is sort of ignore this equation. What I did previously, is I just ignored this equation. Forgot about the inhibitory neurons. Think about setting this to a constant and only considered excitatory neurons. Okay. Okay. And that's what happened here. So okay. what, what, what can the SIG mode function do? In, so what do you mean? Uh, so, yeah. Wait, so, sorry, say that again? Uh, what's the function of the sigma? Sigma, just the sigma. Sigmoid function? Yeah. Uh, the sigmoid function is just, I mean, it's not exactly sigmoid. It's, it just gives you, where does sigmoid go? Oh, so this no, sort of, um, so this equation here, it's sort of not a bad way of thinking how it, this is, this is psi E. Remember this, this one here is a function, sorry. There we go. Um, this psi E is a function of nu E and nu I. So this is sort of not a bad way to think about, I probably shouldn't put a 10 in there, should I? Let me take out the 10. Okay. Um, so this is not a bad approximation. This is sort of what these gain functions look like. So the sigmoidal is this function up here. Um, this function up here, e to the x of one plus e to the x. So it sort of rises, the sigmoid has this shape. And when this, this is basically when, when this point is zero. Mm. Uh, okay, so it's just, it's not exactly sigmoidal, but it's not a bad, bad thing to, way to think about this function. Okay, mainly makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay, I'm gonna keep, so you should definitely, definitely stop with questions. Um, it's much better that everybody understands things than, the, than I finish the material. And if anything in my lecture doesn't make sense, feel free to email me. Okay, so what, the great, what the conclusion of this is, if we fix the firing rate of the, of the inhibitory neurons, so remember, basically we fix them to some value. Um, the, the neuron could be, the, the network could be fired at zero firing rate, all neurons could be completely quiet, or all neurons could fire at 100 hertz, but we can't have this low firing rate equilibrium, okay? It's just not possible not with steep gain functions. Okay, if the gain function were really shallow, uh, it could, so actually, 
it's sort of worth thinking, talking about that. Um, so if we have new E, again, 45 degree line. So if the gain function were really shallow, right? If we could write psi like this, so this was psi E. Zero. Then this is a stable equilibrium, right? So I have psi e prime is less than one. And you could have, so if gain functions were not steep, it's easy to get Okay, so it's easy, you know, if, if and, and as we'll see, not seat means not very strongly connected. Um, we could easily get, you know, firing rate equilibrium wherever, wherever we want it. But the truth of the matter is in reality, these gain functions are super steep and that makes it really hard to get a low firing rate equilibrium. Okay, so how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna get a low firing rate equilibrium? Um, and of course, we have inhibitory neurons. Okay. But let's ask what happens. So what we're going to do now is plot, um, is we're going to say, okay, we're just going to change the rate of the inhibitory neurons. Um, this is new E. Again, this is a 45 degree line. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to plot psi e of new e comma new i for different values of new i. Okay. And what happens? Something actually sort of surprisingly happens. So this is. So remember, this is about 100 hertz up here. So this is, let's say, with new i equals zero. Okay. As usual, we have equilibrium down here at zero, up here at a really high rates, but this is unstable. Okay. So now we're going to increase inhibitory firing rate, right? and what happens? What happens is we increase inhibitory firing rate, psi e actually gets smaller. Uh oh. Sorry. So let's say new i equals, let's say one hertz. So this didn't work at all. Okay. Increasing the inhibitory firing rate, maybe we lowered this a little bit, but it was still close to 100 hertz. This is zero and this is still unstable. Okay. And we could try increasing even more. It just doesn't help much. Okay, we can pull this one down somewhat, but it's really hard to get. We remember we're trying to get a mean equilibrium firing rate of one hertz. Okay. So given this picture, it looks impossible to get a low firing rate equilibrium. Okay. And what we're missing, or what we've sort of unconsciously incorporated is this standard view of neurons 
that um, so we use a standard view. The neurons don't fire that input. Uh, this is probably wrong. Okay. Um, if you take, so certainly if you take an isolated network of neurons, you can actually do this by growing neurons in a dish, um, they will fire without input. Okay, so we're gonna um, now switch to the less standard view, which is neurons do fire without input. I am going to, okay, I'm gonna save these to photos. Unfortunately, Zoom only allows, um, let me double check their save because I don't wanna screw up and not, not be able to save these. Yes, they're saved, okay. Save these to photos. Has my video been off the whole time? Don't know. Um, I'm gonna stop share. Stop share. Share contents again. Start over with, so we can't back up anymore. Um, and so we're gonna now assume that neurons fire with that input. Okay, um, and so what does that mean? Actually, Okay, we actually don't need, so this is new E, psi E, new E, comma kind of I. Okay, so this is basically, with new I equals zero, um, we get a picture like this, right? New equals zero, the neurons are actually firing, so psi E maybe looks something like this. And as we, Increase that happen. I actually made a slight error, as you guys will see in a sec. As we increase new i, it goes like this, and eventually we get an equilibrium. So this is increasing new I. Okay. So in all these intersections, so what's critical here is each one of these intersections corresponds to an equilibrium. This one down here is actually stable, um, but it turns out we're not gonna care about that one. So what we're gonna do is that's Kind of where I screwed up. So what we're gonna do is plot, put new E on this axis, new I on this axis, okay? And what we're gonna do is plot um, the equilibrium value, so the equilibrium um, as a function of new I, okay? So when new i is zero, that's this curve, new i equals zero, there's only one equilibrium right here, okay? 
So because neurons fire without input and because these gain functions are steep, if there's no inhibitory neuron, all the no inhibitory input, all a neuron can do is fire like mad. And that's entirely consistent. If you added um, a GABA blocker to your brain, if you blocked inhibitory input, um, all it would actually fire like mad. Your whole brain would go up epileptic and you'd actually die, okay? So what happens when new ion increase a little bit? Well, as we can see from up here, kind of exaggerated, as new ion increases um, at a little higher firing rate, there's still only one equilibrium, one equilibrium. Eventually, when new ion is high enough right here, oops, sorry. Um, Get another equilibrium right here, okay? So for high enough new I, you get equilibrium right there. And then as new I increases, um, you get another equilibrium You get another equilibrium right here. Oops, shoot. Um, oh man, sorry gang. That's a little bit better anyway. Okay, so actually I'm gonna put a line down here. Man, sorry. You'd think I'd be better at drawing. So this corresponds to some point right here. And now as inhibitory input increases even further, you get fixed points on either side of this. Um, and the fixed points look like this. And you get a picture like this. So basically this is equilibrium excitatory firing rate as a function of inhibitory firing rate. So this is an incredibly important curve. It's called excitatory null klein. And what it tells you is for a fixed value of inhibitory firing rate, it tells you the possible excitatory firing rates that, that the network could have. And if inhibitory firing rate is, it says something that is kind of intuitive. If inhibitory firing rate is zero, the neuron can, network can only fire at maximum firing rate, like it was around 100 hertz. As the inhibition increases, at some point, the network can actually fire at some lower firing rate. Okay. Um, uh, either right here or right here. This is an equilibrium. This is an unstable equilibrium and acts as a threshold. Above that threshold, it goes to high firing rate. Below that threshold, it goes back to low firing rate. Okay. This is actually not a good picture at all. Um, what it actually looks like is about something like this. So this is 100 Hertz. Um, and Lokland actually hugs this line, comes down like this, goes up here. Okay. Um, and there's something that's that's really, really important, and that is um, along this branch of the man not again. Along this branch of the excitatory of the um, curves, uh, 
Um, this is the unstable branch. Okay. So this is, so along here, so this is unstable branch. The slope is positive over here. Okay. Slope's positive. That's our threshold, right? If you go above threshold, we go to high fine rate, low threshold, you go to low, lower fine rate. And the much better picture looks like this. Um, inhibitory fine rate, let's label axes, new E, new E, and new I. Um, so this is really, really important to understand because everything I say for the next, um, next like this lecture and next lecture is going to be based on this figure and it should be kind of intuitive again at low inhibitory firing rate all you can do is firing at very high rate at high inhib at higher inhibitory firing rate there's a threshold you either sit there at zero firing rate or if you somehow go above threshold you go all the way out here okay and so again if you fix the inhibitory firing rates there's still no equilibrium Okay, so how do we fix that? So this is, this is remember the inhibitory alkaline, sorry. It's excitatory alkaline. And what it tells us is, it tells us new excitatory firing rate rate for fixed inhibition. Okay. That's what that's they base a definition of an old line. And it's super useful for analyzing things. And we can even draw arrows, which tells you direction things going. Go like this and go like this. Okay. And what I plotted what these arrow Errors are our the new EDT. Okay. It says firing rates are the new EDT is positive here, firing rates increase. It's negative here, they decrease. Along this line, the new EDT is zero. Okay. There we go. So along the line, d nu e dt equals zero. So that's the excitatory null line. What about the inhibitory null line? So we could construct that in exactly the same way. So what I'm going to do is plot here. Actually, over here. Um, I'm going to plot again. So this is new E. Now I'm going to put psi I. New E comma new I. Okay. For different values of new E. Um, and so let's say new E is zero. Remember neurons can fire with that input. So this would be new E. So this is. New, I'm oh, sorry. I'll put new I on this axis. I'll put new, new I on this axis. So this curve is new E equals zero. Okay. And that means there's an equilibrium at, so an equilibrium. at new i equals psi i of new e new i, okay? And so um, over here, we'll put the new e new i. So when new equals, new equals zero, new equals zero, there's an equilibrium. All right, let's go the way around.
Okay, um, there we go. New E, new I. But new equals there, there's an equilibrium at some value of new I. As new E increases, um, the equilibrium just moves up, okay? Okay, so these dots correspond to these equilibria here. And because new E prime, the derivative with respect to new E is, is less than one even, this is stable. So you get a curve that looks like goes up something like that, okay? So this is the inhibitory null client. Okay, I'm gonna draw it on the, on the curve before and then we'll talk about it, it should make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna draw it like this. Okay, I'll draw it like this. So inhibitory and alkaline. Okay. And again, and this is actually stable. And this one should actually also make a lot of intuitive sense. If you fix the excitatory firing rates, and made the inhibitory firing rates really big, it would try to be pushed back to this line. Making inhibitory firing rates really big inhibits all the neurons and their firing rates drop. Inhibitory firing rates gets too slow, the firing rate increases, okay? And so now, and these errors are trajectories, which means if you started with it right here, fix excitatory firing rate, you would go in this direction and you go in that direction. Okay, so this is, this is, you should definitely deeply understand this figure. I'm gonna give you a couple write-ups um, to learn more about it. Um, it's not very intuitive where it came from. Um, the first couple of times you see it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's, it's really important for understanding how networks of neurons work. Okay. So what do we have? We have, this is the unstable branch, okay? But what happens um, when we start, let's say we started, so this, this point here is an equilibrium, okay? This is our equilibrium. So the yellow dot's an equilibrium. It looks kind of unstable, right? However, what if we started right here? We started below the equilibrium, the inhibitory firing rate's a little bit lower than what it, what, what it was. Um, so because we're to the right of, we're over here, um, the excitatory firing rate's going to increase, but so is the inhibitory firing rate, right? So we go up. So we go up to the right, but we're also pulled up. What happens when we cross that? When we cross this line, excitatory and oak line, now we're pulled towards zero. We're still going up and we cross here and we're pulled down. It's possible if you arrange things properly to spiral into that point. So this equilibrium So this equilibrium can be dynamically stabilized. Not sure if that's how you spell stabilized, okay? And it kind of makes sense what's happening, right? As soon as excitatory, excitatory activity increases by a little bit, um, 
and we're down here, right? We're pulled up because inhib inhibition is too low. It's pulled up, right? And then once we get over here, it's pulled down again. And if inhibition is really strong and really fast, this happens almost immediately. If inhibition is too slow, it doesn't work at all and we oscillate, okay? So this, by drawing these null clines, we've explained two things. We've explained a potentially low firing rate equilibrium. And remember, I talked about networks of neurons love to oscillate. We've explained oscillations, okay? So this is a purely qualitative picture. What we wanna do is convince ourselves that this really is a stable fixed point, okay? And that's, in some sense, it's icing, right? You can tell it might be stable just by drawing these pictures, but it's nice to um, put a little bit of mathematical rigor in that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use, again, perturbation theory um, to compute the dynamics of, of dynamics near this fixed point, okay? So remember, let's go back, let's go to our uh, equations. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to wait for, there we go. Let's go to our equations, um, tau e, d nu e dt equals psi e of nu e comma nu i minus nu e and tau i d nu i dt equals psi i of nu e and nu i minus nu i. Okay, so we're going to linearize around a fixed point. Just so the Taylor expansions come in again. So new E equals new E zero plus delta new E and new I equals new I zero plus delta new I. Okay. So I'm gonna work out sort of in detail, psi E, psi E, and so remember, new E zero is our fixed, fixed points. So let's go back to here. And this point here, we're gonna call new E zero, new I zero. Okay, that's our fixed point. So we can Taylor expand plus delta nu e comma nu i zero plus delta nu i equals psi e of nu e zero nu i zero plus partial of psi e with respect to nu e zero. Delta nu e plus partial of psi e respect to nu i zero, nu e zero, nu i zero, delta nu i. Okay, I'm gonna give this a name. I call it psi e comma e, and I'm gonna call this psi e comma i. So the first of these, the E, first E tells us it's, it's the excitatory gain fun. The second E tells us what um, we're taking derivative with respect to. Okay, so when we take this and we put it back into our equation for, for uh, new E, we get tau D delta new E dt equals psi E. Um, plus psi e comma e delta nu e plus psi e comma i delta nu i minus nu e zero 
minus delta nu e. And as usual, psi e cancels delta nu, nu e zero because um, this is a fixed point. Okay, and we get psi e comma e minus one delta nu e plus psi e comma i delta nu i. Okay. That's our linearized dynamic around the fixed point for new E. You do the exact same thing for new I and you get, um, so I'll write them both down, tau E, E delta new E, DT equals psi E comma E minus one, delta new E, minus the absolute value of psi e comma i delta nu i. And the reason I did that is remember psi, partial of psi e respect to nu i is always less than zero. If you increase inhibitory firing rate, <coughs> um, the equilibrium firing rate drops. And we have tau i d delta nu i dt equals psi e comma i oops psi i comma e delta nu e so this should really be approximately equal to um minus minus absolute value of psi i comma i plus one delta nu i and this is a typo delta nu i okay so we have about two minutes left i'm going to write down the matrix equation so d d t of delta nu e Delta nu i equals psi e comma e minus one. Actually, psi e comma e minus one over tau e minus absolute value psi e comma i over tau e, psi i comma e over tau i, and minus absolute value of psi i comma i plus one over tau i, oops. Delta nu e, delta nu i. Okay, so these are linearized dynamics. Uh, and next, next lecture, we're gonna solve them um, and find stability of this, of this problem. Um, so I'd highly advise you if this doesn't look familiar, especially this matrix equation um, to go review a little bit uh, linear algebra, um, especially linearized, linearizing dynamics and looking at fixed points, and it'll make things a lot easier. Okay, so I'll put all this on the website. I'll give you guys a couple um, background papers to read and some background um, write-ups I've made. And hopefully this all made sense. Um, and I'll stay around for a few minutes in case anybody has any questions.
Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm still confused about the thresh threshold. Sorry, confused about which? Uh, the threshold. Mm, maybe. The threshold. Um. Sorry, what you're referring to? When yeah. you talk about the. Uh, the plot, plot of oh, figures. So you talked about. You mentioned about the threshold. Was it this plot or uh, this plot? So you're talking, when I said, you mean when I said this, this acts as a threshold? Oh. Is that, sorry, oh. is that what you're referring to? Um, yeah. I mean, so so think about, so forget about all the math and think about, you have a, a large network full of excitatory inhibitory neurons. And except usually these neurons interact, so the, the inhibitory firing rates can go up and down. Um, but instead, let's say you somehow fix the firing rate of all the inhibitory neurons. So that's yeah, so all inhibitory neurons fire 10 hertz. 10 yeah, hertz. Okay. okay, so actually, I'll write this down so it'll be so we'll know exactly what the setup is. So, large network. Of excited, sorry. So stop me if I'm not answering your question because I'm not 100% sure it is, but it is kind of guessing. Okay. So somehow all inhibitory neurons are firing. at 10 Hertz. Okay, so let's look at some, this is an E neuron, it's excitatory. It's getting lots of inputs from excitatory neurons 
and also from inhibitory neurons. But all these inhibitory neurons are firing like mad. They're firing at 10 hertz. And there are about a thousand of these, of these inhibitory neurons providing input to excitatory neurons. So it's really inhibited, okay? And in fact, all these, so basically all excitatory neurons are inhibited. Are massively inhibited. Okay, they're just getting tons and tons and tons of IPSPs. <clears throat> so I, I assume in the last, you've had biophysics, so you know about IPSPs and EPSPs. I don't know. ISP. So basically, when when it when an inhibitory neuron fires, if you look at it, this is, this is V, the voltage of some neuron, whenever an inhibitory fire neuron fires, it sees a little dip, okay? So this is time, and this is called an IPSP. Okay, so this is inhibitory neuron fires, um, and it causes the, the voltage of this neuron to drop. Okay, and if you have, you know, you have a thousand neurons, you just get tons of these IPSPs. They just, you know, just goes down, 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 down. And remember for this neuron to fire, its voltage has to go up, up, up here so it can fire. So does this picture make sense? Yes. So basically it gets, it gets all these IPSPs so it's sitting way down here, oops. Sorry, okay. So it's really, it's voltage is sitting way down here and the threshold for firing, this is threshold for firing. Okay. So that means, you know, if you have all these neurons firing at 10 Hertz, um, this neuron is, it, this network has an equilibrium at zero firing rate, right? All the inhibitory neurons are quiet. They're just getting massive, massive inhibition from this neuron. Um, and so the, net, the excitatory neurons are, are, are just quiet. So that's basically what that is, is this is this line here. Okay, there's an equilibrium. You know, if you fix the inhibitory firing rate, let's say 10 Hertz, excitatory neurons can just be dead quiet. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm. So remember, inhibitory neurons tend to shut other neurons off. And if there enough of them are firing, um, then all the excitatory neurons will, will be turned off. And now, go to this picture. Um, however, what if all these excitatory neurons started firing really at really high rates? Okay, you have a bunch of neurons. If they're all firing, let's say at 50 Hertz, what's gonna happen? So this is, you can now get IPSPs, which look like this, an IPSP, oops. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, an IPSP looks like this, sorry, EPSP. Now, if you have lots and lots of EPSBs, neurons, instead of being down here, can be up here. And once it's up here, it just starts firing like mad, okay? So now this is, this is basically new E, let's say new E equals 20 Hertz. So now the excitatory firing rate dominating over the inhibitory firing rates, all the neurons fire like mad, and they basically go to their maximum firing rate, which means instead of being out here, they actually live out here along this line. 
So the two, these two extremes should actually make sense, right? This is where there's so much excitatory firing rate, the neurons are all just maxed out. And here there's so much inhibitory firing rate, the neurons don't fire at all. That makes sense? Yeah, yes. But, so if that, and then in between is a threshold, right? Yeah. Um, so this, mm -hmm. this, I mean, if, if this is inhibitory firing rate, this acts, this point acts as a threshold. Mm, so threshold is a point. And yeah, containing so that's, that's about the information about the inhibitory first frequency of the inhibitory neuron and the excited. Wait, say that again. Uh, mm. I, I wonder threshold is uh, defined uh, mm, uh, how to say threshold. It contained the information about the uh, inhibitory neuron frequency. And well, the threshold is. Yeah, yes, yes, it definitely does. Okay, so the higher the inhibitory firing rates, the higher the threshold, right? If, if, if inhibitory firing moves up, the threshold moves up. If neurons, inhibitory neurons are firing large, at high enough rates, the network's gonna be shut off no matter what. Mm. And of course, if the neurons are firing at too low a rate, it's gonna be turned on no matter what. Yeah, yes, I agree. Kind of makes sense, okay. So that's, I mean, it's sort of, it's not, so I never, it's kind of, a, it should be a nice way of thinking about it, right? Neurons can either be dead quiet, firing at a higher rate, or in between as a threshold. Mm. It's like either side of a mountain. You fall down one side, you fall down the other side. Mountain, yeah, it's a mountain. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I actually have to go now. I've been in the meeting, um, but we'll we'll definitely think about this. If you and if you have any more questions, definitely email me. And like I say, I'll put a bunch of write-ups on on the website that hopefully will be um, somewhat clear. And I will add this to. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Gatoran.